and tonight's lecture title is Fucking with Interoperability. So already from the title you will see that will be an interesting night. Um, the lecture is delivered by Brian Boygon and the focus of the lecture is a cultural lab project. Ra uh, Brian ra ran the cultural lab um, in Toronto in a rock club from 1991 to 1994. So it's very interesting format and I'm sure that Brian will explain the scope of the um, cultural lab and also what was what's going on and especially the atmosphere. So the participants were coming from architecture, art, film, video, music, comedy, science and fashion. And they were disoriented because they were, all these different disciplines were mixed up in thematic panels and um, they will also be organized around themes that Brian will uh, propose that will be like from insider criticism to weak links to deep sticks. So you already understand that all this titling will also push the speakers to uh, expand their idea of like, uh, of architecture especially. Um, so it uh, was a new space where speakers were hosted on stage and especially this was happening at night uh, with cocktails. Uh, so it was a real idea of propose different perspective and produce a different cultural idea. Um, Brian is a, a design theorist, an artist, an art director and a writer. He's currently director of the Faculty of Art, Architectural Studies and as associate professor at the Daniels Faculty of Architecture in Toronto. And his main area of expertise is the field of alternative cultural production sites, science fiction, locomotive design and video game architecture. He's trained as an architect, but has been involved with uh, um, digital pop-up design events since early 90s. Um, in this moment, his current research focuses on invent invention of a science fiction city called Interopera and the development of a motion pathway theory for design modalities. Um, tonight, the lecture is also connected to the other architect and somehow the cultural lab is for us an interesting uh, example of what in uh, cultural production and architecture can do without uh, being uh, something that is being built. But it's also a way of thanking uh, Brian because he recently donated some of his archive at the CCA. So it's very interesting to have his research material with us, especially because it's touching all this culture uh, and project around the 90s and all these kind of like digital aspects that were really very interesting. So he donated to the CCA three projects, a cultural lab symposium series, Cartoon Regulators, that is a theory-based project involving avatars, animation, and data space, and Spielville, that is an adaptation of a television, for television based of concept of cartoon regulators. The archive is very rich of all kind of like documents, notebooks, early uh, digital uh, media, um, and would, will be processed and being ready for researchers to come to study uh, in the end of 2016. So in name of CCA, I would really would like to thank Brian for this donation that is really adding more research material to the to CCA holdings. Um, so uh, we wanted to introduce also Cultural Lab in the, uh, the other architect. Um, we arrived too late. So, but this is, uh, uh, is a, a way of having Cultural Lab as part of, of this idea. Um, and um, I also would like to um, say, say a few things, like the exhibition is still up and for a few weeks until the 10th of April, so if you still have not seen it, I think you have still a few weeks an opportunity to see that. Um, I also have the pleasure to um, let you know that John Oakman, who is here with uh, us tonight, will be tomorrow in the gallery at 11 in the morning to respond to the um, exhibition is a new series of programs that we are organizing in where we invited key um, architecture historian and scholars to respond to our uh, exhibition and the, the themes we're bringing up. 
so this is the idea of the other archetype is that was also a way of bringing more content and more discussion about what uh, architects and can contribute to a, produce a cultural agenda. So please join me in welcoming Brian Bolden. Hi, good evening. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Giovanna. Uh, I wanted also to thank a few people regarding Culture Lab and uh, its recent iteration to the archive, Martine de Leiter and Pamela Casey, also Mirko Zardini, Bruce Corobar and Phyllis Lambert, who all were fundamentally involved, at least in the early days with uh, Phyllis and Bruce and now later with the rest of them regarding this, the home of this material into the CCA. So um, I'm grateful for this, and I want to walk you through, mostly what I'm going to be walking you through tonight is, are the 90s. And I'm going to try, I think as Giovanna mentioned, I'm going to try and give you a sense of the atmosphere of this period and the pivotal conditions that surrounded the working environment from the transposition of the analog to the digital. So. Culture Lab was an experiment modeling the beginnings of the fundamental transition between the analog and the digital, and this transit field impacted everything. In the early 90s, from 1990 to 94, everything changed. We went from machines that we fed, like the copy, uh, photocopier and fax machine, to feed, that's, uh, machines that fed us, like the video Arcadia and the computer. And Culture Lab, took this technicity and used it as a kind of lettering guide to spell out the new world of interoperability that was about to happen. Culture Lab paralleled my visual work in the digital and even its sponsors, such as Alias Research's co-founder, Stephen Bingham, while he went on to invest in my avatarial work, uh, the cartoon regulators in Spillville with Broadway Video in New York and Paramount Pictures in LA. He, along with my art dealer, Sandra Simpson, of the S.L. Simpson Gallery became the most significant presenting sponsors of Culture Lab. To them, I am more than grateful, but you have to understand something about this. In order to dive into this world, it's really a world, although I'm dealing with the cultural theory end of the, of the spectrum, it's really a world that tried to track the, really the depths and the problems and the, the excitement and disorientation between the, the 10 years that um, catapulted the analog to the digital environment. This was a world in which the formative frontier, I used to refer to it as the digital Dawson, and this was the world in which culture and theory had to catch up uh, along with architecture, and this was, in effect, Culture Lab. I wanted to dedicate this talk tonight to, a late, to the late Leon Golub. Um, he was a close friend of mine, he was a mentor, and he was almost my godfather. He represents to me the beginning of this transition between the analog and the digital. He was cutting up newswire images and grafting them like Dr. Frankenstein across his deeply violent acts of painting by scratching back the anti-chiaroscuro of his tarpaulin canvases grommeted on the wall against his studio ladder and knife cum scalpel. In 1993, I conducted a dialogue with Leon Golub at the Storefront for Art and Architecture entitled Frankenstein Up Front, whereby I identified and traced Golub's painting attack on his sutures embedding and lacing up new anatomical spatial structures, and this was, in fact, architecture for me. A new kind of architecture where images, meaning spaces, in fact, were now strapped together with different cultures and made interoperable like Culture Lab by holding up letting, meaning simultaneously remain at its source while representing. This was both in my early work before Culture Lab and now this as it is fucking with interoperability from 91 to 94. At that time, uh, this is in 1988, um, I, this piece, Roadrunner, THX, I was deeply involved in trying to figure out this new space, what it was, what it was about, and how it was about to hit screens and rock our entire civilization. I used cartoons and their pathways, jokes that acted like Freud's catheters in his book on jokes and his nuance of laughter, Ignition, from Bewilderment followed by Illumination. If you look, Sorry, if you look then at the, la at the fast lane of culture and its cartoons, the surfacing of information and its interoperable properties eventually started to show up. This was important for me because prior to the digital domain, um, 
that the only area of real advancement in the technicity of the image was in the area of cartoon animation. And this was followed all the way from the 40s right up until the 70s where the pathway itself and the containers that were constructed around them from um, the, early, the early cartoon animations in the studios all the way up to the, um, the later ones that eventually wrote with CGI. And you could trace meshing and modeling and spline algorithmic um, constructs if you've traced the field of cartoon animation and that related directly in my case to architecture and the movement of it. Um, at that time, at least cartoons would, along with caricature for me, become a method for speaking about others through avatars and thereby freeing me from the gravity of architecture, allowing me to foil my way into the future. The 90s was still a decade dedicated to building being in the baseline of architecture. I was beyond the perimeter and, even, and couldn't even imagine this to be the case. For me, architecture, it is today, for me still, a steady state of thinking. It was, at, it was at this far end of the spectrum that cultural thinking began to emerge out of my broader uh, interest in information architecture and the metaphor for it in architectural theory. And I began to design Culture Lab while I was producing this book. Utilizing a science fiction, speed reading Tokyo, and in this case, aliens, I started to rip up the pavement and look below grade to see if this network of information actually had a form or, or was it just a mesh of wires and were we able to get root, that we're about to get routined into an international candy factory for text and email via the ethernet. In 1990, I designed this book, Speed Reading Tokyo, and a montage, it was a montage of information architecture that was based on a very rare paper that I was able to secure when I was working at NTT in Tokyo for a think tank. I secured a white paper that Vice President Al Gore penned pretty well himself with two other individuals called the Information Highway. Um, not that I used it so much, but it did, I did find it compelling um, because it was a way in which the um, Department of Defense at that time began to domesticate a lot of those off, offshoot technologies into the mass milieu, which eventually gave rise to the internet on the internet, uh, in which the World Wide Web would eventually sit and impact everything from us to architecture, certainly. Um, this is a still from the inside of that, uh, uh, the novel. And again, this is kind of pre-digital, so all this work is kind of uh, a kind of series of superimpositional transparencies that are laid in against um, each other and they're more or less compressed in fields and then rephotographed and typically um, it's all driven out of the photocopier which I'm going to touch on in a little bit. This is a section of the book that was consisted of two components. It's a, a, a fictional writing piece about these two aliens who came to the planet Earth from Mars uh, and began to look at the diagrammatical landscape of information and, and try to extrapolate what was going on there and I began to kind of resuscitate this work and use it in the culture lab to set up programming, ins instrumental kind of programming features within that landscape. This image, THX Tokyo Up, was the kind of operational objects I began to make. Uh, it was these objects that I would eventually um, extrapolate, as I mentioned, into the visual static and style guide for Culture Lab. To give you some backstory on the surge of thematic symposiums that I created in some ways, breaching books by breaking spines with both my hands on deck at the photocopy machine, distorting life, and hosted for three years at the back of a rock club between 91 and 94. Let me give you a sense of scale first. So when I first visited Elizabeth Diller, Liz Diller, in 1990, and she participated along with Rosalind Krauss and John Oswald in the theme Weaklings of Culture Lab 3 in 93 and 94, Scofidio and Rick were working out of their studio in Astor Place, and they had four people working for them. I was still being fed by cereal left over from the 1981 edition of Bernard Chumley's Manhattan Transcripts and the 1981 edition of Baudrillard's Simulacra and Simulation and Deleuze and Guattari's 1987 English translation, A Thousand Plateaus, the 1984 edition of William Gibson's Neuromancer, some schizo culture, Blade Runner in 1982, bookended by the film The Matrix and backended by the early work of Jeff Koons with his Equilibrium Tank and Tanks in 1985 frequent stops at the East Village Gallery in New York called International with Monument, and rushing into the 90s with Cindy Sherman and the scatter art of Mike Kelly, and some early stage sets by Robert Lango, Longo, and then some along the way, some architecture which began to provoke me, such as the 1981 Steel Cloud done by Studio Asymptote, the LA Gateway project, etc. 
I was also making forays as an architect on the internet via propaganda films. This was first generation HTML. Um, I barely knew how to script and it was mostly heavily laden with drawings which we then began to model and to kind of script code with these engineers who couldn't speak English or any other language but code. And I was, I was making my forays into this world through propaganda films who basically helped create the music video for MTV. And they gave me my first architecture commission for Michael Jackson and with Atlantic Records. Uh, again, this was my universe. This universe for me was very important. It was a universe that crossed between architecture and entertainment and became synonymous with Culture Lab. Culture Lab was a, sing a singular invention, a kind of reactivity to the lack of interaction between the disciplines. There was certainly no interoperability, let alone any fucking with it. Uh, Lambert and Korobar first met in 1991 at one of my Culture Labs over a bowl of Pad Thai. Stephen Bingham and Susan McKenna, who founded Alias Software and basically pre-authored the first spline modeling algorithm from a University of Waterloo mathematician, um, were sponsors of my um, Culture Lab and then went on to sponsor my other work. And Sandy Simpson had just been, had just been uh, launching my speed reading in Tokyo and was deeply engaged in um, hosting the closed tape sessions for Culture Lab on her second floor. These were all important moments in the, in the construct of Culture Lab because although Culture Lab was social, it had these deeper roots in the development of software around CGI at the beginning of Hollywood, where the Abyss and Terminator 2 became the basic signposts of 3D modeling and liquid motion within the field it, and in digital domain. And, uh, and Alias was part of that, and I was part of that directly through Culture Lab and then again through my own work, which I'll explain. Just as I was starting Culture Lab, I co-created a studio with Sanford Quinter at the University of Toronto, five appliances in the alphabetical city. Our students were productive. I was completely preoccupied, however, with the pedagogical text as an object site for performative architecture thinking and becoming, which became central for me in my teaching, but also in my writing. Our students also almost burnt the entire School of Architecture building down, um, which wasn't so great. And Dean Eardley at the time brought um, Sanford and I into his office and said, after you guys started setting fire to the third floor of the school and almost burnt it down, parasiting the services of the building, one of you is going to have to leave. And so Sanford said, I'm good for it. And so thank you, Sanford. And he went on, and we went on to publish this article as a manifesto, so-called manual, if you will, the five appliances in the alphabetical city um, in assemblage uh, in 1991. Broadly speaking, people did want to, that is us at the time, architects and architectural idealists. Uh, we wanted to cut across the corridors of the disciplines, but science, from science to techno and other architecture, but no one seemed to know exactly how to set up the check-in desk at the sweaty hotel and remember which key was given to which guest, et cetera, et cetera. It's all a bit confusing. And so, enter me. And I would constantly use these kind of texts, which again would re resurface in Culture Lab and again in my later research work around the period that had to do with a kind of fictive uh, modality around the cartoon and the diagramming of space using the cartoon as a new temporal field. Enter me. I was an architect, for that matter, and other architect. And um, for that matter, with the necessary reach into film and art and video and music, ac uh, the academy writing culture, um, club culture and consumer facing technology through companies like Propaganda Films and still later, like now, with anonymous content. I sort of felt, if you will, like I could have been the key man from the Matrix. It was tumult and yet all commercializable. This I'll be speaking about a little bit later, but it's a sample of one of the texts that were, I constructed and collaged together, wrote, and then prepared as these sort of stim notes, stimulation notes for the, uh, what I call the players, the presenters, that were used to kind of carve out a new field of thinking for them in the process of presenting in the, in, in the back of the rock club that they were going to attend in the future. However, there were two important things that coupled the early days of our culture together just around the cusp at the beginning of the internet. Um, and the were, it was, in fact, the internet's ability to kind of lamineer the World Wide Web and its receptacles. You had to create receptacles before you could plug into them and play. And I followed, by, for the most part, I followed the music industry because it was way ahead of all the other arts for producing and creating new technologies with limitless format wars and modes of originality transmission. This was the very story of culture, culture Lab as well, and a typical Canadian post-McLuhan wonder bar of having to create receptacles and then insert content into them from the CCA to the four-track the four tape deck. This was Word, and the difference was this Word world was not 
interoperable just yet. From 91 to 94, I contacted umpteen cultural producers and theorists, slammed 48 of them through a social media architecture using a rock club as my bait and switch apparatus, and this, in effect, was my architecture. I'm going to show a couple of clips. This one's just a... Good evening. Before I actually begin um, my real introduction, I, I wanted to um, deliver some information pertaining to the layout and procedures of tonight's laboratory. Uh, they are as follows. The speakers will make their presentations in a consecutive fashion, followed by a panel discussion that will be opened up to the floor for questions. We have removed the floor mic and have opted for a room mic that will not only pick up your voice, but also any audio sound produced involuntarily by your body. <laughs> we look forward to hearing from you. All presentations are video linked to the bar, will be as a result of this attractive service. After this discussion, all the panels will be here for a party in this room, and you're all invited to that, of course. There'll be free food sponsored by the Rivoli. And I realize that this very idea of trying to transfer your desire from critical tourism to party animalism may be somewhat difficult. However, <coughs> welcome analytics of cultural theory back onto raving bodies of popular culture. Those who think better while moving than standing still. Last session, I attempts at diving into the ice rink of popular culture where anyone over 17 loses equilibrium has produced a curious slipping and sliding like the cartoons below ground in Alice in Wonderland. It seems that to move the investigative bonfires from the encampment in theoretical baseball cards, crushing the pretentiousness of cultural commentary from Adorno to Oz into the deep fryer of post house vending machines everywhere, not goofy Game Boy, but smart game people everywhere. One of the great stoics. Laertius once said, if you say something, it passes through your lips. So if you say chariot, a chariot passes through your lips. So when I say extraterrestrial, you can bet one of them will seize the opportunity and pass through my lips. I want my diatribe in two parts. 
part one. I was a teenage alien who sucked the brains out of my friend's parents' heads. That's why I'm as smart as I am. Also, I never believed for a minute that I was going to be left here for so long. I'm pushing 60 and still my ship has not come to get me. However, what I have done while I have been here, well, for one thing, while experiencing a great epiphany. And finally, there is some dispute as to the actual existence of extraterrestrials on your planet. Now, let me put this to rest once and for all. Some of you have made the remark... Okay, um, you need to pipe up the volume on the video, please. So, I didn't want to interrupt that one. Culture Lab was only possible because the 90s were about to be killed by loose wall brackets barely yet supporting the move between the analog to the digital race for space. It was this decade that became the handler of the transposition from the typewriter to the computer, television cathode ray screen to the binary liquid crystal display, and, and to the revolution from the IBM DOS to the Windows 95, and ultimately to the invincible Shepardian of the Apple operating system and now not so distant cousin, Android. What was then a war of connectivity has become a war of non-connectivity. This was the background that played Rachmaninoff through the synthesizers onto the performative dance floor of Laurie Anderson. This was the 90s. It was the beginning of that decade when architecture was a complete mess of directionless directions. It was like going to a party where you recognized everyone as human but did not know any of them. You could see styles and such but would constantly be saying, don't I know you and yet you didn't. And this would happen like 50 times over. Bad party, bad architecture. This was a decade of running from out of control controllers, bad pixel paint software, barely any splines, and postmodern what they called criticism. Going awry, zone books, and reaching for a basket of remote controls. This was not a decade of consolidation like the one we are in. This was the decade of the boundlessness and the useless. We were destroyed by artificial sugar, and the beginning of the 90s was marked in the art and architecture world by a kind of, in my opinion, disillusioned and slacker culture that spent more time on figuring out how to put the orphaned excess of audio tape back into the four-track cassette than actually playing it. We were tired of fiddling with new appliances, but we just had to keep dealing because new media, including new architecture, required a consumer producer skill that we just did not have yet. This is a piece I did at the time in speaking in the Utopia and Culture Lab and used remnants of it for the stim notes and it's called the cartoon dispenser unit so that we didn't have, we didn't have operational means to kind of pull or even push information. We had to borrow other fields. So I often would kind of look to the kind of more manual post sort of uh, post-war appliances like the Kleenex box and the idea that you would kind of pull through that slot information out or in this case cartoons. That was kind of in effect some of the idea that we were kind of dealing with um, and trying to deal with. Uh, but we just had to keep dealing because new media, including new architecture, required this consumer skill, which we didn't have. And we were like parkour people, dashing across a runway with nothing to rebound off or to. We were limitless, and culture theory and its architecture uh, were also limitless in mirroring the Death Star of mediocrity. Another piece not dissimilar to the one previously for Culture Lab called Mickey. The epitome for me uh, of this curious time within the architecture of m multiple styles was, was capsulized um, in 1989. I was walking with Leon Golub in New York on a sunny day, and I, an article just came out in the New York Times on the edition of uh, the Michael Graves edition, the 1981-9 Michael Graves edition, which did not happen to the Marcel Breuer Whitney Museum of American Art. And I said, Leon, what do you think? And he said, quote, Brian, it's like fucking the dead, unquote. And so, such as it was and as is now, the early phase of the 90s decade was plagued with a kind of hopeless postmodern cover-up, or Leon, in Leon's case, necrophilia, and in a kind of Estee Lauder makeover at the graveside of the already dead. It was at this point in our recent past that the darkness of Halloween architecture began to wane as the moon began to rise and illuminate the diamonds of Zarkon as they showered up upon the shields of the star, uh, starship Enterprise. We were seriously in trouble. Photocopiers were going to die. We were all going to die. We were about to become digital, and no one knew what that would mean for our archaeology, let alone our architecture. Um, so to whom it may concern, 
please be, please be advised that Shannon McGaw is now the coordinator of Culture Lab for 1992 to 93. Please allow her to use the Xerox machine. In any case, I started Culture Lab in 1991 and ran it until 1994. So those four years of the 90s represented a sample of what thinking and building looked like at the brink of the digital. I decided to put the pressure on, to push the architects out, and give them packages of calculated correspondence, stim notes, that I called them, and then I told them all to come prepared to be rock stars. This is another bunch of examples of the stim notes. The loose list that I used to send them, and this is slightly updated, but nonetheless not dissimilar, would go something like this. Uh, time release drugs, speed reading Tokyo and the information net, information anxiety and Richard Saul Werman, who by the way I ended up modeling um, Culture Lab Book One after in terms of the template as it related to his access map cartography model that he was using that was modeled on his first book called Information Anxiety. Design as a social operation, Eisenman and Decon's d structuralism, implosion, MIT Media Lab and the first commercializable institution. I was involved in MIT in the early days in the 90s where you would basically present your work to a bunch of researchers, but at that time you would also be presenting to sponsors who were going to be your research sponsors and you'd be splitting your patent or so-called intellectual copyright um, product with and you would go into a deep kind of research spin with the kind of mercurial side of, of, of commercialization right at your side. It was a very kind of interesting and exciting new model that MIT had, um, had, had first developed. Um, feminism, mobile cell phones, Levi's, comparative literature, Spillville, more commercial, commercialization, spilling productization, Michael Jackson and Walter Yetnikoff, MySpace, Japan, New York, LA, Alias Software, Terminator 2, SL Simpson Gallery, Collins and Malazzo, Met Metro Pictures, Impulse Magazine, Propaganda Films, Anonymous Content, BMW Films, which I worked on, Cyberspace Conference with Ro Aliquary Roseanne Stone, the first electronic arts conference with Bingham in LA, Rabin Abraham on Dynamical Systems Theory at Santa Cruz, Sanford Quinter on The City, Cynthia Davidson on Any, Ketchup Splinters, Blur Commodity, uh, Early Equilibrium Tanks by Coons, Sigmar Polka, International with Monument, Metro Pictures, East Village, Queen Street, Cronenberg and Eisenman, Carolyn White, Impulse, City TV and Moses Neimer, Art Metropole, the trajectories of which would go to Catherine Bigelow, Adam Brooks, Will I Am, Mike Jerkovac, the invasion of the computer in SimCity and the Monte Carlo method algorithm, Victor Gruen, Five Appliances, Assemblage, Storefront, YYZ, and Mercer Union. This is another one of the notes that would go to the participants, what I call the players. And now, I need to screen one other. You need to put this up, please. Okay, um, um, Peter Eisenman. How many Chris here for, uh, is this thing working yet? Uh, for moral support. Um, I hope I can remember uh, what I wanted to say tonight because I'm still writing my lecture that I gave 20 years ago and therefore I have nothing prepared. Uh, uh, I'm about 15 to 20 years behind in the written texts and since architects don't write very quickly, uh, I'm going to have to wing it tonight. I also hope that um, my silver gray hair, my wire rim spectacles in, in, in the PC sense of the word, but I'm usually the squiggly, uh, out of line person in any panel that I do. <laughs> find myself suddenly tonight to be the straight man, <laughs> which I'm uh, certain uh, I didn't know about ahead of time, because uh, reading the CVs of these wonderful people with whom I am uh, here tonight reunioned, um, I thought, ah, oh, Andrew Ross, Princeton. I used to have an 18th century country house in Princeton. I could talk to him about that. Uh, and then I saw Eve Sedgwick, Duke University, and I thought, wow, I'm a Dukey fan, a Blue Devil fan. We could talk about basketball all the time. Um, 
And then uh, I said, Chris Shepard, sound terrorist. Well, I have a son who's a sound terrorist. Uh, I thought, says he to himself, on the plane coming up here, I'll be able to talk to these people well. And then we had a kind of rehearsal this morning, and I realized that all of those strategies that I had uh, uh, so thought that I could uh, effect tonight were really uh, probably improbable, if not impossible. And therefore, I'm desperately trying to locate myself in this uh, situation. I don't think you'd hear Peter say that very often. He's desperately, desperately trying to find himself, lo locate himself within a situation. <laughs> so um, anyway, this was one of the kind of constructs that I wanted to kind of exemplify tonight is the more sort of social fields of their, the delivery of the material and not the material itself to, to give you a feel for the construct that I was trying to aim for and the kind of blending of culture. So I produced, in, in effect, I, I, I tried to invent and produce the kind of thick atmosphere in a rock club. Um, and I called it, obviously, Culture Lab, but how did this come into being exactly? There was something fresh about music, about rock, about a rock club. There was something unknowingly exciting about coming to a show and watching some random rock star want to be a rock star, become a rock star, become. There was something peculiar about it. There was something that y was exciting to be parachuted into this entertainment vortex, the way it turned people into sluts, the way it destroyed the shelf life of identity and threw up its young, the way it create, created cultural sacrifice at the altar, then television, now computation. There's just something about its speed, about its design unrest and badass behavior that everyone wants to be a, sp a star, that somehow intellectual life cannot quite cut it on stage. There's something dirty about that. There's something about the disorientation of the rock club that intrigued me, to insert smart talk for fast people there. And I was enamored by the music venue, struck by its technology, as it seemed to always be slightly ahead of that visual. And audio, as Gibson said, was one of the greatest forms of virtual reality to what a sound conjuring space could be conjunctive in its etymological inter interoperability. This was my world then as it was now. And I traveled across the abyss of the academic life and ended up in, the in a pool of blood at the mouth of the reckless. I was neither comfortable with the conventions of anything really, nor were conventions resounded in me as a big bad voodoo chant of con conform conformity. This is what I wanted to avoid at all costs. And this is why I decided to put on a show that would destroy its players on stage. This was my act of destruction. I wanted to set fire to the intellect. I wanted architecture to become something instant, something wrong, imperfect, drenched in lighter fluid, bent halos, warped minds, and speed reading structures so there'd be no time to make anything stand for long. I wanted to make architecture a monster and make it interoperable with the fleeting arts of music and movies. I wanted physicists to attack its mechanics and then go to parties. I was teaching at this time. Um, the one studio I remember giving uh, before I left to kill it in the rock club with a drafting machine was the Holiday Inn and its double, based on our Antoine Artaud's The Theater and its double. However, it was a heavy metal exercise. I asked students to design a Holiday Inn beside an existing Holiday Inn at Yorkdale Shopping Mall in Toronto, and we had a field trip to one that was there. I asked the students to collect images of all the after-party shots in hotel rooms where heavy metal bands had stayed while on tour. I asked students to, to dissect the carnage and audit how these mundane rooms became mutinies on the bounty of rock music and why it made things so interesting. This was my foray into my last studi studio before I launched Culture Lab. And for the same reason, I ended up at this poster, um, some of the abstracts at the second international conference on cyberspace run by Aliquary Roseanne Stone, who came to speak at Culture Lab, um, and um, who was then the head of uh, Austin U at Media, uh, the Austin U Media Lab, and a gender bender game theorist, and a precursor to SimCity, uh, a game called Habitat in particular, where she distorted all the genders in the, in the game and kind of reconfigured family members and also spatial members in so doing. I felt that there was something uh, under the beginnings of the digital parlance that made this new performance so intensely stunning. There had to be a way to create a new architecture for thinking people and to do this in a world where menus were useless and people still smoked indoors each in, in each other's faces. This had to be a way to mesh thinking and there had to be a way to mesh thinking and being in the pioneer villages of bits that were about to go binary. 
uh, after Culture Lab in nine, sorry, sorry, after Culture Lab in 1994, um, it was by no means over. I decided to, decided to move venues to uh, Culture Lab to music, um, um, music television, and the internet. I began. This is a from a a still shot from a show bible that I began to develop for um, 18 to 24 year old co college students uh, on, in rock video uh, music channels to kind of readapt. Culture Lab in a format that was delivered through uh, and during music videos. Um, and I, I, I evolved this and, uh, further over a course of um, eight years from 94 up through into early 2000 um, and ultimately it ended, ended with a project called Catch Up, which is to catch up, so to speak. Um, and it was uh, to commercialize um, Culture Lab in a field of disciplines related to architecture, but also other forms of design and blend them this time instead of with the um, producers but with brands. Try to kind of distort the brands who started and evolved and developed design inventions like Levi's developing a host of kind of inventions in the apparel business and all these companies that were trying to do that. I tried to retrace them back into concepts like surfing and tried to reweave them but use the brands and said again like producers to do that. Uh, yet I was still restless with the discipline of architecture at that time and the inquiry and I was fed up with the lack of integrated thought that could be gleaned across those who produced and those who theorized culture. Yet, for some reason, I was struck by this idea that you could take a brand. Uh, this is the interface that we developed for Catch Up at the time in the, in the late 90s. Um, interstitial video on the left, a series of illustrated cartoons on the right that uh, established dialogue, and the whole series of chat bars below that constructed these kind of convolutions between the two upper um, diptychs. I was driven, perhaps fueled by unutilized anger, but who really cares, to create a different model, one that pushed rather than pulled architecture, music, film, science, fashion, comedy, performance, art, out into the open where the purveyors of each and every discourse would be forced to survive at the brink of collapse, embarrassment, fear, and to wit I would systematically trigger the predatorial instincts of each and every participant of Culture Lab and beyond. This was, in fact, fucking with interoperability, to see if things could cut across subjects and interoperate, become part machine, part human, fueled by packs of lies and feigning connections that just were and were not all there. How could I ask Dr. Harry Luda, the nanophysicist, to talk about surfing? And uh, how could I ask Chris Shepard, the rave DJ, to talk about the impact of ecstasy on space? How could I ask Peter Eisenman to talk to Chris about drugs and Harry about super surfaces then? And how could I ask Rosalind Krauss and Liz Diller to talk about weaklings? Ed Goyan on interception, Tom Levine on voicemail, and Sanford Quinner with his active soft system tearing up the grid that Gibson had already maimed through the cyber matrix. How could I exactly? Diller and Scofido are currently working on what they call an anti-monograph of their work to be published by Princeton Architectural Press and released in the fall of 1994. Elizabeth Diller. Thank you, Brian. Um, I was very confused initially when uh, I was asked to come to a culture lab. And the biggest question in my mind was, um, what do I wear? Should I dress for a club? Should I dress for a conference? club conference, and I finally decided to wear the only clean thing I had. And then when I was asked, what, to, you know, uh, what would you like to drink, I thought, well, coffee, martini, coffee, martini, well, let's have them both. And then in, in wondering what to talk about, should I give information or entertainment, information or entertainment, I decided to go the info, infotainment route. Okay, so this was my story. Um, it was, uh, these are a series of spines related to my story, drenched in the dark ooze of alien liquids that I was playing with at Alias at the time when they were producing The Abyss and Terminator 2 and I was working on early algorithmic models for my cartoon, re cartoon regulators. Um, and this was meshed along the columns of Camp of Canterbury uh, Cathedral while people were starting to do way too many drugs and lose sight of the cornfields that, and what bus got them to go there. This was life gone in 60 seconds with, with uh, Lacan telling me what is a picture. This was a diagram here um, that I've been working on since 1990 that tr was always trying to track as I was the battle of representation from the projective to the transmissive spaces of early culture lab and on to today. Life during the 90s 
um, was like a wild drug blur of flying bricks and bad perfume, smashing glass against hard copies of the two Pauls, Jean-Paul Sartre and Jean-Paul Gaultier, banging off each other, falling into the medieval catapults of commercialization and the Gruen transfer. This was a world where, um, sorry, Best Buy windows would be full of exper uh, experimental partial objects from Cyarc in LA and the AA in London, and then sprinkled with some cano canonical whatever tropes from Chumis on murder, Liebeskin's cranking metaphysical machines at Cranbrook, Rem getting delirious about leaving the film world, and you have to understand these excursions were all about pulling alternative subjects into the presence of practice or theor theorizing about that practice, and mine was about pushing it out. Sorry. No one was pushing, sorry, um, no one was pushing into the mall, no one was really shopping, nor pushing shopping carts home, and for that matter, even paying attention. No one was really learning from Las Vegas. That's what see-through ovens were for, and we were, and we were way before our time. And there you have it. We have a shattered, we were a shattered bunch of lost escapades, dying at the cross circuits between moving sidewalks and shopping centers of fire and ice, shattering glass, first generation rave drugs that were barely acceptable, a, a four track cassettes being tossed in dumpsters, all the while Walter Yetnikov playing the drums on the bass synth machine as people inhale blow all around him. Just a word about Walter. So um, in the course of this 10 year process of evolution around Culture Lab, I, I was involved with a number of early technology liftoff um, uh, authors and then I was revisiting them again 10 years later. So at the beginning, um, I, I was given the commission to design the, um, the little spaceship enterprise so-called for Michael Jackson and Atlantic Records and uh, Walter Yetnikoff had just brokered a deal with um, Columbia Records where he was president to sell all of Columbia's library to Sony because Sony needed content for its Walkman which helped it I'll later explain introvert, create the new space of introversion within the city. And so Walter was kind of seminal in that operation. He was seminal in changing the course and the nature of that technology by, by leveraging the library over to Sony and then Sony becomes a label. This was often the case where the technology that first produced the machine like the phonograph, RCA, then has to become a record label to provide the content for it, et cetera, et cetera. And these movements were key and crucial to the, the transposition of space at the time between different aspects of social, social being and the construction, in my opinion, of a kind of di uh, digital um, urbanism. Um, we were not baby boomers, nor were we millennials in the 90s. We were middle people. We were the lost tribe between semiotics and robotics and still are. Not long before browsers were invented, we were not post-war and we were not the future. We had very big, cell phone, flip phones, and texting was a chore like chopping wood. To be interoperable in the 90s required that you lug around a Ziploc of AC electrical receptacle converters for London, Tokyo, and so forth and so on. This became the internet just before the internet and just before Culture Lab, and I had written this book, Speed Reading Tokyo, along with its precursor that I was privy to, Rem and Bruce Mao's book, um, The Burning Crow Leader, as I call it, the SMXXL. I was trying to suggest by using two Martians in speed reading in Tokyo as my Romulus and Ramus that information was overtaking the physical property of reality and becoming the new urban outfitter and that diagrams were wiping out our interaction. I took speed reading Tokyo, commercialized it into a walking, talking, interoperable shitstorm of data and screeching voices coupled with shredding that of the project into stim notes that were sent to culture lab participants for their invitation. These notes were like sharp objects flying into their brains by taking shrapnel off the Do Tokyo grid and into the trance-like drumming of the 90s cave rave. The argument, however, was a simple one and forged the super frame in which Culture Lab would eventually launch from, that information architects were going to show the world just how interoperable we were and had become, and that it would only be a matter of time, a short time, as in now 2016, that interoperability would be the operational tenant of the grid. And like a translator that is tied to your face, you would never be able to rid yourself of its grip on your body without organs, coupling its partial objects with its partial flows in the premonitionary tale of just what it would be like ultimately to become a consumer producer, and in this case, a tinker thinker, slow down architecture. 
The problem then, as I saw it and see it now, is that interdisciplinarianism with McLuhan, Gibson, Anderson, and were the folks along with Bjork who were slamming into the television set, and it was not going to yield. It was not going to become, it was not going to be until the World Wide Web and the likes of inference engine, code engine models and the disciplines would finally be pushed to the brink of collapse and it would then be up to the scripting generation to tear up the driveways and lay down the matrix. This would then give us interoperability. Parties were given, cartoons would take shape on stage and uh, my culture lab performance correspondent uh, correspondence followed by the jamboree on stage cut deep into the cur uh, current conventions. Um, and here today, just like the agents of the analog, isn't Grasshopper simply the agents that agency needs to couple partial objects with partial algorithmic flows, then you have a new kind of form producing receptacle. Wait, Culture Lab, taking advantage of the impropriety of the rock club and social slamming with it against smart people that started to weep, cry in public. When, for example, have you ever seen an architect cry in public? Except at a modernist funeral, rock stars cry all the time. They love crying and overdosing. They love being excessive. We need some of that then and now. This is what Culture Lab did. It took Malcolm McLaren, scraped off some of his DA, DNA, and put it on through the Laurentian Library grinder and sent faxes to Rosalyn Krauss, Adam McGuigan, Liz Diller, Elizabeth Sussman, Sanford Quinner, Manuel Galanda, Harry Ruda, Jane Sibbery, Elizabeth Gross, Aliquary Roseanne Stone, Collins and Malazzo, Reiner Crone, David Most, Philip Monk, Ronald Jones, and 30 or so others to pin, pin them to the donkey of interoperable discourse and to make pinatas of them thinking and being and sweating in the dark change room at the backstage of a rock club, trying to see if Rene Tom's catastrophe theory would be activated, making R.D. Lang's sanity, madness, and the family come to life on stage by dislocating the subjects and fracturing objects against them. This was Culture Lab. Culture Lab and the, dig and the digital dub tables at the rebirth of public introversion. Jacques Le Goff could track confession back to the sixth and the ninth century through papal papers and show us just how the birth of modern psychology surfaced by placing confession behind the curtain and then later updated by post McLuhanism of being private and public, not in cars, but with Walter and the Sony Walkman headset. And now by the tiny social space we occupy on the screens of the mobile in our tiny little apartments. The 90s produced mayhem while setting the stage for short-term thinking. The Academy too was drowning to the violin of Claude Levi Strauss. Disciplines from the 50s forward with the exception of the Ratio Club in London from 1952 to 1956 resisted combining artists and scientists in the same beakers. Video games were barely off the pong table Philosophy launches the ontologists, literature launches complets, architecture flirts with narrative, science turns towards the genome project, MIT media launches blend, blended theorists with commercialized Kickstarter products. This was the 90s. Imagine a building accessible to a thousand plateaus and a thousand doors. This could never happen. We are not going to become rhizomes. We did not lose our bodies. We were all still so hungry. That was Culture Live, a kind of drip for the brain. And this is how it went. There was nothing to hack back then. The planet was like one big after party strip left over from the aftermath of Hunter S. Thompson and the likes of the Wolf of Wall Street. The World Wide Web suddenly appeared, bucking the internet, suddenly starting up like John Car Carpenter's 1983 Christine, the haunted horror car. It was just like laminated onto the code matrix of an internet thing some people say was started by DARPA. In closing, my long closing remarks, using Wile E. Coyote just after Culture Lab. I lectured in my, on the cartoon regulators for the ENU conference here and for any place in this very room in 1995, which is the room that I spoke in back then. And although the 90s transitional decade was a royal mess, Kurt Cobain and the grunge scene had just started as did Starbucks outside of Seattle. Jim Clark had created a web browser called Mosaic that he claimed could screen da uh, data and also 3D space. And it was still the founding future of both architecture and a new kind of producer culture. Wandering as a neurotic secret agent brought into the classical landscape to wreak havoc on any of the models of transcendence that were getting in the way of progress, evolution, minecraftiness, and such and such, I was determined to produce and evolve Culture Lab out of the matrix. I took Culture Lab to Sony BMG with Cyclops Productions and created a pilot for a short form series on MTV and, and web called Splinters, still as as it were, trying to economize the cutoffs of architecture 
and embed them with the perform of the meaning that would eventually become to bear witness in the culture lab and its scripts and in the commons of its now future. I'm just going to show you a little clip of that. A demo treatment we did for um, Sony at the time, Sony DMG, and MTV with um, John Kane, who was the director. <laughs> trying to, uh, in that uh, video, we were trying to um, combine um, the analogical kind of motif of the microfiche, the XY axis, and then of the fiche finder, and then uh, broadcast television and then the computer and fracture it all. I mean, it wasn't that successful yet, but we were trying, at least I was trying to try to figure this new space out, the space that was gonna try to transport um, the projective technologies of culture and the transmissive ones within this field and give it a kind of character that would be reminiscent of a kind of romantic space, if you will. So and uh, from 91 to 94, um, this was the interoperable point in language that allowed for culture lab and cultural producers and theorists to share the same stage and in effect share the same, if you will, liberty. That while bewilderment would be followed by illumination or hum humiliation, here at the siphon point of cathode rays and liquid crystals display would follow a new kind of architecture from the culture lab. Thank you. Um, time for questions for Brian in French, English, you can translate. Thanks a lot. That was quite fascinating. Um, how did you get into this? How did you how did you sort of start this? I mean, how did you move from your frustration, I suppose, as an architect, to to moving into? I guess it was, it was just around you. How, how, did, how did you? I mean, you kept on sort of poking through it. Um, I the 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 world that I was in um, the. I was attracted to the entertainment um, world because the technologies there would always be leveraged much quicker mm -hmm. than say even in building today, for example. And so, and in particular in music, like we always looked at the packets of, you know, um, transmitting audio because it would be faster than video, et cetera. So I was very drawn to the entertainment business because it just fueled a lot of ideas much quicker. And in my case, I could kind of intellectualize those. So, um, and, and, our, and, and I, I came at it really through a small window called the pop art pop-up architecture world, which was the world in which brands would hire people like me to do quick little design projects like Mobile Grace Mine, like make a little mobile museum for them, for Levi's or for, you know, whatever, to promote a record. And they would kind of want these instant architectures to emerge. And I got involved with the entertainment companies through that. And then I be became involved with these people that um, were trying to design the internet. They had no idea, like Michael Jackson needed a space for his CD. Like they didn't understand it as a website. They thought, I guess we need a building. Maybe we'll call Brian, you know. And then I would get involved. And they say we need you to design a building for the internet. I said, what are you talking about? And they, because at that point, the the DARPA had kind of ported over um, the internet through the World Wide Web protocol. But the space there wasn't any space there. It was like still vacuous and needed form. And so we were trying everything. I would try a building there. We we had this this markup language called VRML, virtual markup 
language and people were building 3D cities and trying to see if, if the internet could hold it and host it and it couldn't. It couldn't manage it, couldn't manage the mirroring. But it still, it offered, me an, uh, it offered me the opportunity to experiment in this whole new kind of field but using the entertainment kind of fuel. It seems very clear that uh, you wanted the really to put architects in a in this room where they will be they had to perform differently and from the video you s you show you see the surprise of Peter Eisenman sort of like I don't know what I can speak with these people and even Luis that that will be like I don't know how to so it's very clear what what you wanted to achieve with for your lab what what you think was their how uh, what do you what do you think from the point of view of the architect of putting when were put that in that condition with this other discipline with the topics that you were trying to I guess you were you were much ahead of all of them so it, in in these things with this discussion like how how was their reaction to what you were trying to do um, uh, okay so. They were, th it was a little, my role was a little bit punitive about uh, the architects, that is, that I was a little bit tired, like, you know, the, say the Chumi transcripts, for example, or, or any of the architects who were working with uh, external disciplines, and they were po constantly pulling in and appropriating those disciplines through the conventions of their own practices, whether they're, you know, um, those had to do with representation or writing or whatever. But I was really, I, I was, I was, uh, I was getting, um, I was critical of that practice because I didn't think it took into account what uh, the other modes of expression were were out there in their own capacity first before they began to do that. And that you could push architecture out and see where it would go. If you pushed it out, what would happen? So there's a little bit of a punitive aspect where everybody got defensive like Liz and say, Peter, well, what, what am I doing here? This is like insane. And then eventually, I because I had this language, I invented this sort of cartoon language which created a kind of alter sort of like personality for the group where I would say dipsticks or the weaklings and I would explain it in a kind of broader cultural field that kind of disarmed them and said, okay, I can deal with this. Uh, like Rosalind Krauss, you know, she wrote an article on weaklings. She understood it was part of Vatimo. She understood it was part of weak thought, but then I could also include, you know, um, for that matter, um, you know, Harry Rudot, you know, the physicist or, you know, a rave DJ and everybody could kind of fit together and they almost kind of fit together through cartoons. And so what it did for the architects, I think, I was ahead of it for, for lack of a better reason other than because I was plugged into this other world with all these other people, that they could see, like I would have comments, like Liz would come up to me or say, Rem or somebody, and they'd say, you know, it was interesting for me because I, I, I know I felt, I felt like I was a little bit on trial uh, for my kind of like, you know, sins, uh, uh, you know, meta-languaging everything, you know, into the discourse. But it, then I could see, he said, I could see, like, I could see, like, Chris Shepard, he's not an idiot. Like, you know, he, he spoke eloquently about what what was the what were the properties in which in the ingestion of hallucinogenics did to those spaces? What, what, what how were they constructed differently? What did they mean, and how did they work? And he said, I, I began to see how architecture. We should go outside with our discipline. We should take our discipline with us, and see. But the problem was that before Culture Lab, at least anyway, there was a it was at maybe the ratio club I mentioned. Um, it was difficult for people to take it out because it wasn't a language that they could hold on to. And I gave them this sort of cartoon stim kind of back a cereal box quality to kind of disarm them. And, and then I think they started to yield some interesting aspects of interpretation during the, the course of the symposium. Yeah. I want to add to Giovanna's question <coughs> if, let's say, if what these people took out of it, who was the public? And do you have any idea how it had, how let's say the the sequence of seminars or symposiums have maybe influenced the cultural life in Toronto, where it was based, or, but who was the public? Who were these people coming in? Was it mainly architects or mainly? It was, it was the public that the invitees were there, like it would be um, architects, academics um, from various disciplines, um, musicians, filmmakers, artists of all sorts, fashion designers. So it was the, the complexion of the, the symposiums itself was mirrored by the audience. The difference really was in the 90s, and I'm sure it's similar now even to a certain extent, but less so there because in the 90s, in the 90s we were all, we 
we were all kind of equal in a way. We were all like out there trying to figure out, well, what are, what are all these relationships? How, do, how are they all going to work in the future when this technology starts to just, just destroy us, you know, just amalgamate us and make us all one and, you know, just a bad dream of McLuhan happening before our very eyes. And everybody was trying to figure it out. So you would cut over to another discipline just to check it out and go, well, wh music was always doing this, but we also did it with fashion and film and all the rest. Like Adam McGoyan, I would call up Adam and I would say, Adam, what are you doing? And he would explain and he would say, you know, I'm working on this narrative. And I said, what do you think that has to do with architecture? And he would explain what he thought it had to do with architecture because I would bring architecture to him. And then he would talk about it versus me pulling him into, you know. So it, it anyway, that was, the, that was the nature of it. In terms of the impact, I don't know. I mean, it's got a, got a legendary affect that it, it, it had a, a lot of um, influence in terms of its ability to create transdisciplinary space for architects in particular and the academy. It certainly was, um, it was kind of uh, influential in, in proposing another environment. I mean, I, always, I was saying this earlier to Lev when he was interviewing me yesterday here at the CCA that it's always curious to me that the format of the delivery has not kept up with the content of the delivery when you're up here. Like this is just completely antiquated to me on every level. The microphone and the screen and this here you see in the whole, it's just not all nearly as worked out and as advanced culturally as the content that one is speaking about. And I find that, for, again, in the academy, the university, I find that you go into a lecture hall, raked, I'm not saying a raked hall shouldn't be useful, but there's ways in which content delivery are really um, severed from their ability to progress by not addressing the technicity of the space in a more direct way. Yeah. Just to pick up on what you're, what you're starting to say there, so where are we now? I mean, looking back on this, is this a kind of nostalgia for this explosive uh, kind of rupturing moment that has at this point become codified and, and we all, you know, we, we somehow absorbed it all, assimilated it, it no longer provokes us in the same way. I mean, wh where are we now and where are we heading? Huh, such a big question. <laughs> 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 um, okay, well, um, I was asked, Lev asked me this too, so I got a little bit of a rerun on it from yesterday. And I was saying that um, I think where we are now, where we are now um, regardless of the kind of nostalgic aspect of this kind of like cacophonous environment of anxiety and production, I think where we are now is that um, this, the, the lamination of social networking in the software fields of the internet have produced a new space, a new urbanism, a new condition of the social. And it's the early, it's so early. Like, like I barely, I, I barely got over working with Steve Bingham, who's, you know, and, you know, who's, who helped kind of formulate the first algorithmic models for spline modeling that Greg had echoed in his, in, you know, Indigo Machines in the Archaeology of Knowledge. That's 10, 20 years ago. And then, so 20 years, so we're barely starting, and yet there's a new layer, this social layer. And I think this social layer, like social media, despite the kind of tropes of it being, you know, um, pr uh, superficial and, yeah. Oh, yeah. Curiously problematic. There's something in th those space, there's something in those networks that is producing a new kind of social space, a new temporality that we have to pay attention to that as architects. I think that there's a role for us to take in that world the, and, and urban uh, designers and all the rest of it and, and, and space makers. I think that there's a role and, and I, think it's, I think it's urgent to look there and I think that's the space. I think that's the space that will become something. It's nothing right now. It's ridiculous. It's not even fire, you know? Yeah. Just, just, you know, just struck me in the question. I thought, what were, you know, people of the Renaissance thinking of, you know, when they were going out in the fields and they were measuring these stones and they were drawing them and, uh, you know, it, that was a new technology for them, a new way, th they had new technology, they had new ways of looking at things, new yeah. spaces. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And, uh, so, you know, it's a kind of interesting to, th to try and think of that in relationship to what you're talking about. Yeah, like a kind of disorientation in, un, in under the invention, the culture of invention, where people don't know where to place things. Yeah, exactly. They didn't yeah. know what it was. They yeah. Just, you know, they were I think that's true. I think that's true for today. 
You, we, have no, we, are, we are complete, in my opinion, the obsession with consolidation is just a reaction to complete and utter disorientation in the space. Like, no one's controlling that space, and no one is paying attention. I mean, everybody's paying attention, but really, this space, the internet has changed everything, absolutely everything. Every spatial and social relationship that you have in the world is now circumvented by the World Wide Web. And this is just, like, we have no idea. We're like, we're, we're not even at the telephone yet in that environment, <laughs> you know? So I'm speculating on it. I continue to speculate on it. And I think to your point, Phyllis, you, you, uh, at least I have two choices. To understand the present, you can go back just like you did. Let's look at the Renaissance just for a minute. Or you can go for it, go to the future, which is sort of what I'm doing now with the interoper. I'm going 5,000 years from now. I'm working with the nanophysicists to get the logic right. What does that look like in order to see what this looks like? Just like you would go historically back to see I mean, in a kind of simplistic way, but I think that's the can I think that's the the catapult of you know trying to locate yourself. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Brian, and um, yeah, I think. But thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Thank you.